I fell in love with the Santa Eulalia district in 1977 when I was doing my master's thesis. Got fascinated by the minerals, recognized fairly quickly that very little was actually known about the district in a regional sense, even though it was and remains the largest manto and chimney system ever found in Mexico. A few years later, when I had the opportunity to spend the next seven years studying the district in detail, and I mean everything from regionally mapping the district, uh, the entire mountain range, down to looking at the isotopes of sulfur and oxygen and carbon, the outfall of all of that was a very strong list of geologic features that indicated where the ore fluids came from and the recognition that there ought to be more in that direction. And that has sort of guided the exploration into Gigi. Buff colored unit. Yeah. We were fairly astounded in the late 80s to discover that the ground to the south was open, and then additional ground was acquired subsequently. Gigi became one of the three projects that we started Mag Silver with in 2003, based on targeting using the existing CSAMT and NSAMT geophysics that had been done before, coupled with, of course, my field mapping and the work that had gone before that for BHP essentially eliminated some areas from consideration and got us focused in the area where we intend to focus with Reina Silver. With MAG, most of our attention was in the east camp where we got some fairly strong mineralization along the west fault of the San Antonio Graben, which is the host for the San Antonio mine, which is the second biggest mine in the district. One of the things that happened with MAG was in 2008, we had run a couple of drilling programs, uh, actually 2007, and we recognized that there had to be more there and we were being very successful with a combination of airborne MAG and ZTEM or ZTEM. We found we could map deep structure and lithology very effectively with the combination of these two tools. So we flew the Gigi area for MAG with that airborne survey began at a very broad regional scale. Recognizing that Santa Eulalia was a member of a very large family of deposits and that these deposits were well distributed within a belt a couple of hundred kilometers wide and 2,200 kilometers long in Mexico and that there were clusters of the similar types of deposits in the western U.S. and, and elsewhere in the cordillera of the western hemisphere. So we began to compile information on these deposits and we recognized uh, through the process of that compilation that there is a continuous zoning from an intrusive porphyry to scarns in contact with the intrusion to scarns and sulfide replacements associated with dike offshoots from the, the main intrusion. And we could recognize by looking at any given district, how much of the entire spectrum that they could show was present in a given district. And the more we looked, the more we recognized that there were a number of districts like Santa Eulalia where only half of the zoning had been found. And the beauty of the model in terms of Santa Eulalia is that the chimney and manto portion, which is the most difficult part to explore, it has the benefit of being the highest grade, but it's the most difficult to explore and does provide some mining challenges simply because of the geometry of the manto, flat-lying manto ore bodies. What's left to find at Santa Eulalia is the stock, intrusive stock that drove the system and the scarns that we expect to be proximal to that, and those tend to be the large, reasonably coherent lenses of mineralization with a very favorable geometry for bulk underground mining. Uh, they also have the virtue of being high grade. So it's, it's really a question of putting up the model of what we know, not just from Santa Eulalia, but from dozens of districts like this worldwide, and recognizing that half of Santa Eulalia is missing. And that's what we're looking for. And part of the idea is that if the part that we know about there is the biggest of its type in Mexico and the second biggest ever found, second only to the Taylor deposit in Arizona, that the other half of the system has the potential to be equally important. We have very good surface cover, very strong alteration that we can work with. It really is a question of zeroing in on where the intrusive center is in the system and, and finding it in the right rocks.
Saudi Alalia district was probably found in, the, in 1592, 1593 by what were called adelanteros, who were explorers associated with the conquistadores, who were the Spanish group that was moving into Mexico. And they probably found high-grade copper and iron oxide mineralization in the east camp of the district uh, in an area called Chiribel, south of the San Antonio mine. But 70 years later, in the early 1600s, two brothers found mineralization in the middle camp, which is essentially right in the middle of where Reina Silver's property is. Uh, and they operated it for a couple of years by hand, small scale, but very high grade mining, uh, until some of the locals got irritated with them, killed one of the brothers and the other one returned to Spain. It wasn't until 1702 that the big discovery was made in the district. Essentially mineralization was tracked over the next 300 years through different styles and types of ore and, and mining technology from that outcrop for five kilometers to the south and for over a kilometer, probably 1.2 kilometers vertically into the bottom of the Potosi mine. And it is the geometry that was revealed by that mining that is part of what led us to recognizing where the ore fluids came from and what direction we have to explore. So we are the beneficiaries, not only of more modern exploration that's been done, but of 300 plus years of continuous mining by people simply keeping the high grade in the face and following it wherever it led. Well, I worked primarily summers in the San Eulalia district from 1983 until I finally finished my dissertation in 1990. I was warmly incorporated into the communities of both the Buena Tierra and Potosi mining companies um, and worked daily underground and then on the surface um, throughout the district. So I essentially had unfettered access to every working in the district, plus all of the historic archives, uh, which put me in a unique position of being able to generate the district scale map on the basis of work that had been done by generations of highly qualified geologists before me, was able to put together some of the more modern laboratory studies that we brought to bear to understand the district. Mm -hmm.